Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with the Aerospace Structure Series. This little video is going to focus on a practical tool for finite element analysis when we evaluate a single frame. We can actually do a lot with this model. Obviously, it's not sufficient for doing initial design, but there's a lot of post-production work that we can do that utilizes just a single frame. With that single frame, we can get the stiffness of the frame and look at its support to the floor. We can actually evaluate if you have floor loads and struts and whatever else, how those forces and moments can influence the frame uh, critical loads the bending moment distribution, axial load and shear distribution in not only the floor, but also in the frame, because the frame is going to provide a partial support. It's really not fixed because the frames are fairly flimsy relative to a, a fixed support. And it's not pinned because they certainly can take some moment out of the floor. And actually by modeling that single frame, you can get that relationship between the floor and the frame and how it interconnects. In addition with struts or missing struts and all these kind of things. Often what we will do is make a finite element model that is uh, of a segment of fuselage. We'll see some examples of that shortly where you will model up a bunch of frames so you can evaluate the floor loading and how those different frames and floors might share load when you have like an exceedance in the local area and design structures that can spread that out so the structure, the lighter uh, aircraft structure can withstand that. Uh, now, while this is not going to go into all of the benefits, it's basically going to talk briefly about the hows and the whys and give some brief guidance on how this might be done. So one of the usages of this is because in my finite elements course, my students get a little project where they're designing or analyzing a little frame given some specific directions. Those of you in industry that are learning NASTRAN or maybe want to expand your NASTRAN can actually try the same little project yourself with the guidance herein. Those of my students who are trying to struggling to understand the things that they're going to be doing with this little project can actually get some help in a couple of the areas that we haven't maybe covered in as much detail in class. And you can also see some of the reasons and values behind it. So stay tuned. This will be short, but hopefully it gets your juices, your analytical juices flowing to help you start moving toward becoming an even greater final analyst. So just to take a quick look here, if you have my Nastran primer, then we have uh, already introduced how to do modeling with C-rods and C-bars and quads and shear panels and such. And this uh, little graphic is one that kind of shows how some of these elements might be used, where we might uh, try and model in the geometric depth of a frame with like multiple rods and either C quads or shear panels for the webs, or even better, in my opinion, for much of the analysis that's done out there, a single bar frame, which enables us to look more readily at the shear moment and axial load in the frame for doing uh, post-production uh, analytical work of evaluating the moments and shear distributions in the frames and floor beams and struts. So this was out of uh, this little graphic. These little two figures are shown in my book, The Nastran Primer. Uh, you can get a copy. There will be a link here in the video if you don't have one. But this is one of the things that are just kind of starting students thinking about how this might be done. Now, the next thing to kind of set the backdrop a little better, this is a little model of uh, that I, I was doing a fine element study in the early 90s where we were evaluating, we were using the McDonnell Douglas program, CGSA, uh, with uh, CASD, their own in-house programs. CGSA was the McDonnell Douglas equivalent of PATRAN and FEMAP, although it was way ahead of both because neither one could do what CGSA could do at that time. Now, PATRAN and FEMAP have both passed it up. So we were using that combination, and we were, all we were studying is the idea of whether we should use bar, C-bar kind of uh, bending elements to represent the frames, like this, or 
C rod shear panels where you have two rods, one for the outer cap, one for the skin, basically the effective skin and some lumped amount of the uh, outer cap of the frame. Or if we used a three rod shear panel or C quad frame where we had a little element where it represented the shear panel, one for the web of the frame, and then we'd have three rods, one for the inner cap of the frame, one for the outer cap or fail-safe cord of the frame, and one for the effective skin. Now the benefit of those multi-rod panel models is it looks kind of like the structure, and you can actually do some analysis by just looking at the stresses or the loads in the inner cap, and you can do a quick crippling check on the inner cap or outer cap, uh, tension on the outer cap, things like this. Also, it simplifies floor analysis because now you have a shear panel for the floor. You can just grab the shears out of the floor and do your analysis, grab the axial loads and the caps out of there and do your analysis. But you actually lose the ability to look at a more detailed shear moment diagram kind of distribution in the frames and floor beams, which actually has tremendous value for doing analysis and making sure you've covered everything. So what this little graphic is doing is it's showing you this modeling study where I actually evaluated first uh, a model without a floor and looked at just the pressure or a point load distribution for these three models and how they related to a theoretical solution. And then I did a model with the floor with the three different idealizations and then looked at under similar kind of loadings how the shear and moments related in the three different styles of modeling. And uh, so there's benefits for each of these, but what I have concluded in the course of my career that most models for fuselages and other structures should stay on the simple side, the coarse side, where you're using fewer elements that represent things and then doing hand analysis to, to supplement it. Uh, one of the reasons is it's a lot easier to move quickly to have a representative structure and to get it done without endless churn, the kind of churn that ends up making places like Boeing and Airbus and uh, Northrop deliver planes late. Another reason is the simplification of the analysis, the subsequent uh, after the run analysis that can be done that can readily cover everything. Well, a lot of folks like to think that modeling can do everything for you. In order to do that, you need multiple, multiple models with great complexity. And the assumptions that are used are buried within those models and very difficult to decipher or even to figure out if your model is correct. If you keep your model simple, like with a C-bar kind of frame model, it's a lot easier to check quickly to see if the model makes sense. And since Nastran and all the other fine element codes fail to give all of the stresses that we need in order to evaluate a structure without significant multiple models and significant detail processing, it's a lot easier to keep your model coarse and simple, extract your loads in a way that's easy to spot, and then do hand analysis to supplement it or uh, write programs that will do that analysis or Excel codes and things like this. So this is just showing those three models and how the uh, shear and moments related for that study that I did back in, uh, what, 1993 or whatever. So the same kind of principles apply. So what we're going to do with this model we're talking about now is we're going to focus on a single frame and how that distributes load. So let's take a look at that a little bit more. This is a model that I created back in the uh, 1990, I believe, uh, when I was uh, responsible for the nose of the MD-11. And for whatever reason, the model had disappeared or been lost or something. So I got to recreate as a young engineer, recreate the model from scratch, working with the loft and then with the idealizations. And I calculated me and uh, my buddy Vicente. Uh, calculate all the section properties to input into this and talk with all the experts at that time. Now, what you're going to see here is the nose. That was the part I was actually responsible for in trying to evaluate. And you'll see the floor. The floor actually obviously sits inside that nose, but it's a multi-level floor because you have the cockpit there on the higher part of the floor. And then it steps down to the lower part of the floor where like the flight observer station and the first lab would also be. And then you go through the door out into the 
rest of the structure. Now, this was the only structure I wanted to evaluate. We were evaluating rapid decompression for this. So we're looking at the fuselage and the floor and all those intercostals and those complex curvatures and the bulkhead up at the front and a few other little details. But in order to make the model here make sense, we wanted to make sure that however, so you would think, okay, you just model this thing up. You model the skin, frames, or intercostals. You model the floor, and then you just fix it. But if you just fix that back end at Fuselage Station 475, the fixity of that 475 uh, nodes on the skin and floor would affect and change the load distribution within the nose that I wanted to evaluate. So you can't do that. What you need is to eval is to fix it in a way that the fixity and the constraint of where you fix that model doesn't affect anything. Now, if you think about it, the nose, this is not showing the radome, obviously, because that's a roughly non-structural member that hangs off the front. Pressure boundary is shown here. What we really want to do is evaluate the skin stresses and frame stresses and intercostal stresses and loads and the floor loads because we're doing rapid decompression analysis, looking at the differential pressures that occur when you have a rapid decompression event. You get up loads and downloads and on the different compartments and floors and structures. And that's what I was trying to evaluate. And we use this for a bunch of other stuff as well. So in order to do this, what we want to do is fix this model somewhere where it won't affect it. Now, the whole front end of the fuselage acts like a cantilever beam. I have a video on that currently in my Structure Stress Analysis 3 playlist where I give some insights into how to do simplified analysis of a fuselage and a wing and things like this. And the nose is at the front end of that cantilever beam. So really we're talking about loads that are increasing as you move aftward. Now what we want to do though is fix this. So that means we're going to fix somewhere back like where the wing is or something. Uh, something far away. And a typical rule of thumb is you want to be about a diameter or more away from the structure trying to evaluate. And because it can be difficult to simulate the right constraint at the end, and any kind of rigid constraint, or even RBE, rigid body element, in Nastran will tend to mess up the loads anywhere near it. So what I did was uh, a common engineering tool where you basically model dummy structure. Structure that has the roughly the same properties and members, so frames and stringers and skins and floors for some distance beyond the end of your model. And like I said, typically a diameter. So if you look at the diameter of the back end of this, basically you'd want to be about that, about 180 or so inches away. You want structure that simulates the structure that's back there. And then you can fix that behind your dummy structure, fix that. You still want to use some judgment in how you fix that. And what that will do, that will just act like a lot of structure, a lot of elements, but that simulates the response of all that so that nose can act. Whatever loads you load up the nose with will go on and, and react back, and none of the effects of the constraint affect the place where you want to evaluate loads. In order to do this, not only did I do that, analyze, uh, develop the structure in that dummy structure, I also simulated this, the co corresponding loading of that dummy structure so that the dummy structure is not only there as a constraint, part of the constraint, but it also has the same kind of loading influencing it so that the nose, actually the response out of the nose simulates reality. So this was the part of the structure, the uh, nose, fuselage, and floor that I was looking for. Now, in order to do that, I told you I made dummy structure. So you can here see here my nose final and model. You can see the forward bulkhead there uh, on the nose wheel well, because the nose wheel well cut it out is, is right there. So we had to model that as well. Or uh, And then we've got all the rest of this is dummy structure going all the way back. And you can see I'm uh, about two diameters away. I've always been careful. And what you can do, what we did here was I model this up until I got the clean structure, and then you kind of, uh, there are shortcuts you can take to model that. Probably I didn't need the forward plug door in my model, but I put it in there anyways. So this is my model. Once again, I'm trying to look only at the structure 
uh, fuselage and floor forward of station 475. But in order to do this well, I put all of this dummy structure. Now, what this doesn't show is at the back end of this model, I put a wagon wheel, what we call a wagon wheel, because it looks like a wagon wheel, as you'll see now. What we really want to do is fix that structure at the end. But it would be best if we fix that structure in a way that simulates the way the aircraft responds. Now, for this particular model, because this dummy structure is long enough, it's over a diameter away, like two diameters, we could, I could have just fixed all the little points along the skin, fixed them in the one through six directions, and that would have been fine because none of those effects are going to come all the way forward to the nose with all this dummy structure that's loaded. However, a better way to model and a good way to learn to model is to put some uh, element there, a wagon wheel element that does a better job of simulating reality. Now, uh, one way to do that, uh, uh, slightly better than fixing all the points around the fuselage, would be to put a rigid body element, an RBE-2 or an RBE-3 element in Nastran, where you can fix the center point at the center line of the fuselage, and then make all these, make that your independent node, which now can't move, and make all these nodes on the skin, right where the, in, where the stringers come to that constraint, make all of those a slave or dependent nodes to that independent node. That would be one way of making this uh, constraint, and it does a fair job and would have also been fine for this particular model. A better way, especially if you have less dummy structure, is to try and simulate the response of the rest of the fuselage that's not in your dummy structure with your constraint. And to do that, we make a wagon wheel. So just picture that back end. And now what we're going to do is do an isometric view. Uh, let me give you the isometric view first. Here is a quick look at that same model, kind of laid like this. You still can't see the wagon wheel because it's right back here, hidden from sight at the back end of this, attaching each of these nodes where the stringers and the skin attaches to the end of the dummy structure. Remember, all this is dummy, and all this simulates the way the actual structure was. Now, at the back end, looking in that same kind of trimetric view or isometric view, this is what my uh, what my wagon wheel looked like. And I've also got shown kind of hidden there uh, some other details, like roughly where the floor is and the lower floor and the struts and such. But... Those aren't elements here. Those are just kind of for reference. So what we see here is uh, here's your coordinate system. And right here in the middle, there's a single node, a single grid point, which now gets fixed in all six degrees of freedom. As you can kind of see, this is kind of an exploded free body diagram kind of model, as you can see here with this little uh, node here. And in this particular case, I put another rigid element kind of making that point back behind, but really you could be fixed right here at the center of this wagon wheel. Then what you'll see, these spokes. Now, actually, if you had done a rigid body element, RB2 or RB3, it would actually look just like this in Nast in FEMAP or in Patran, where you would see spokes of the wheel showing the relationship between your independent node at the center and your dependent nodes around the outside, around the periphery. But what I did was a little better way and a common way uh, to do this wagon wheel. And what I did is all these are bars. So from that center node to each grid point on the skin, which is where the stringer is tied in and the, and the panels, the C quads for the uh, skin, I put a bar element, a C bar or a C beam element. And that bar element, so now from the center to each and every grid point along the skin, we've got a bar. And... You give it the stiff, a really huge eye value out of plane because the fuselage going back, if we had continued to model it, is very stiff for bending. You can actually calculate an effective, if you look at what the overall moment of inertia is of the entire fuselage, and then divide it up by the number of bars and their taking it account of their orientation. Some of them are less ideal for how that handles, like do that bending stiffness per inch kind of thing. You can actually simulate the precise stiffness of what the, what should go in to simulate the rest of the structure in your eye of that C bar. What, uh, 
a lot of times what I would do and others would do would just put a huge value so that it really is nearly effectively rigid for out of plane bending. Remember, we're two diameters away. We really only need to be one diameter away. Uh, the next thing, we'll put a, a transverse moment of inertia. Usually I'll make that relatively large also, but you could make that a good deal smaller. But remember, your skin that continues has a lot of stiffness tangent to the skin. And therefore, to model that, you can put a fairly healthy uh, I2 stiffness value in your C bar. The one value you want to keep small is the area of those bars. Because what happens is the fuselage, you've got these frames, but then the, the skin doesn't have a lot of out-of-plane stiffness. So mainly the stiffness for uh, stretching is if you have pressure, if the pressure tries to open that fuselage up, make it a larger diameter. And actually the way the frame reacts, that is a ring with the effective skin, basically full effective skins. But this bar now has an axial path, which is many times stiffer for that radial stiffness than what the frame and skin stiffness does as a ring. For this reason, what we want to put in that, uh, a lot of times having no area will be a problem because you're, then you're not, you're, you're not fixed at all. What you want is a tiny little area, like a point oh oh one or some very small area inches squared kind of number which is very small so that that thing can breathe once again remember we're multiple diameters away but uh and you really only need to be one diameter away and we're going to see in our little example case where we even can in some cases justify less but uh giving that a really small area a huge moment of inertia in the longitude resisting longitudinal bending a fairly healthy moment of inertia in each of those bars for transverse bending, which would be like uh, simulating the way the continuous skin and frame support in-plane movement, and a tiny little area. This is a typical wagon wheel, and once again, all you're going to do, put a grid point at the center of the fuselage, fix that mother, one through six. Then you're going to define bars going from that point to each of the grid points where the skin where the stringers come in and tie into that last frame. Uh, and the last frame, you can either put it in there or not, because actually it's better to put it in there, but you could just rely on your wagon wheel. Usually I'll put that last frame in there and then also have these large, these bars with huge stiffnesses, especially for the longitudinal bending, bending in the longitudinal direction, resisting longitudinal bending. And then and then we're going to put in a tiny little area for each of those. That's called a wagon wheel. And now that, and you can throw that if you're in FEMAP or Patra, and you then throw that into a group so you can get that out of your way. You're not looking at it all the time, but show it whenever you need to. And a lot of times you'll leave those nodes uh, that help define it. You're going to want those in both groups, the group that has this wagon wheel and also the group that has the skin. Because if you show the skin, you want to be able to pick those nodes and, and work on them. And if you only have it in the wagon wheel group, but not in the skin group, you can have issues trying to retrieve them and get just what you need. So that's a little uh, way you can do that. So that's uh, a little glimpse into the past with some ideas for how you can do meaningful analysis. Now, if you look at this, this is a model that uh, one of my uh, clients developed for a project that we were working on. We were looking at a, uh, I think this was for the uh, rigid barrier kind of analysis. But in this particular case, the main thing we're looking at is the loads on that uh, cargo barrier, how it influences the floor, how it influences some of the other structures, and so in order to do that, we needed more than that. Uh, we wanted a few need uh, a few frames and floor beams in the region that are unaffected, and then we wanted to do this. We have this breathing wagon wheel at each end. That's both ends now because this is a right in the uh, near the middle of the fuselage or something. So we have wagon wheels on both ends, and now we can put on the floor loading, and that's going to give us the uh, how that re uh, affects the frame and floor and struts and as you can see we got some other structures in here two bulkheads partial bulkheads and things 
We can look at how all that reacts. Now this frame, it's fixed over here and it's fixed over here. And what that does, now it all kind of acts like a fixed, fixed beam with whatever we do is influencing the structures around, which mostly is going around the fuselage, acting on the frames and the floors like this. But then you get some interaction between the floor beams due to the way it's loaded, where the load can kind of be shared by some of the members going between the floors. And everything we're looking at is really a radial effect based on our loading. And so having these fixed with the skin and structure that simulates is not not a, a, a issue or concern. And then we can do some things looking at the loads near the wagon wheel and actually should. We look at those loads near the wagon wheel to make sure that any influence by the wagon wheel is not affecting any of the structures that we're actually looking at. So in this case, we're only looking at a few frames there where you can see some of the loads coming from our uh, rigid barrier coming. So this is kind of how that's done. The whole purpose of this was be able to look at the floor loads that are accurate, the strut loads that are accurate, and the frames in the region where it's loaded, and that make sure those are accurate. In order to do that, we need to carry some skin, and we need to look at some skin stresses there in the vicinity. And we also wanted to make sure that whatever effects that we had had dampened out before we reached our wagon wheel. If I had made this model, I might have gone another diameter or two. As I recall, this is actually a little fuzzy in my mind. But as I recall, we wanted to keep that model on the smaller side. And we just did some analysis to make sure that nothing, uh, that we were confident that the wagon wheels proximity, which is uh, roughly a diameter, maybe a hair less in this particular case, were not affecting the place where we're actually looking at the stresses that we're trying to evaluate. So that kind of shows another example of how these wagon wheels can be used. And the same kind of ideas were used to create these wagon wheels and for many other countless other models that I've worked at and seen people working at can be used. Now the benefit for this, let's take a look at the next slide. Oh, and here's a quick look at the frame. Now this looks like we have a frame with depth, like a frame with multiple rods and panels. But actually this is a, a FEMAP model. Nastran FEMAP, and FEMAP has a cool feature, and Patran does too, uh, where you can actually just sketch the cross-section, and it will calculate the properties of the cross-section. And then it also, when it shows the model, you can show it so it looks like the cross-section. So what we're seeing is something that looks like we have a cross-sectional property for the frame, and a cross-sectional property for the uh, struts and for the floor beams. In actual fact, these are all just bar elements just C-bar elements going all the way around and for the floor and for the struts. You can see some of the loads from the uh, rigid barrier in this particular model. And uh, so these are just stick figure frames, which actually makes data retrieval ideal, as you're going to see in a minute. But it looks like the actual structure, which is kind of cool on a number of uh, fronts. Plus it uh, does the calculation of the properties for you, so you don't have to do that, although that's not that hard. So this is actually what we get out of that kind of model. This is showing a cross-sectional view with the loads. You saw that on the last one. This is a cross-sectional view with your bending moments. You'll notice this is just showing the C-bars that are in the... Now, if this had been rod and panel models, in order to plot a moment diagram like this, you would have to extract loads at each and every cross section through the frame and then plot those up. It is a huge amount of work. And Nastran in your panels won't report what your out of plane, uh, what your transfer shear stresses are and uh, other things. So other issues. By taking your C-bar elements, modeling those as C-bar or C-beam elements, you can just plot the bending moment in those bars or beam elements and you get it's like a shear and moment diagram in reality it's that sure it's that in this case the moment diagram of that entire ring at once we can quickly spot now if you have the same properties in the frame like if the frame was the same all the way around which is sometimes kind of true but usually not completely true 
uh, we would immediately be able to spot, oh, positive bending, negative bending. We, all we got to do is check those two spots and we're done. All the rest is good by comparison. If you have a varying cross section, which is usually the case, uh, you can say, okay, up near the crown, I need that section. I'll take a look at the positive and negative max moments there. And wherever I have down maybe in the belly or where we have bigger frame sections, we can actually look at the max and min or po max positive and negative moments there. And we cut our analysis way down. And a lot of this can be dumped into Excel, which is the way my client did it, or it can be done with a Fortran or MATLAB program like I used to do that kind of stuff. This is a plot of the axial load, similar thing. This is a plot of the transverse shear. So these three together immediately allow us to spot what's the hot spots. Where do we need to analyze? We want to analyze the max uh, bending moment going both directions. We want to analyze the place where there's the most shear. We want to analyze where the axial load is the most or where the axial bending combo becomes most critical. Sometimes folks will take the max positive moment, the max axial load, and the max shear and put them all at the same spot, even though they're not at the same spot. That's a judgment call. It saves a little bit of time if you can show positive margin. Uh, and that's a fine approach. But if you show negative margin, you can then go and do a, what's the moment at a certain spot? What's the corresponding axial load? What's the corresponding shear? And do a little more analysis and get a little more optimum design. So this by using that C bar or C beam element, this is a really quick tool. And here's the floor. This is the uh, left one. I can't even hardly read it. I think the left one is the bending moment and the right one is the axial load. And there is the transverse shear. So once again, we know where to analyze with just a couple an analyses of the floor beam. And we've got confidence. Show a picture like this, show a couple little analyses and it's we can have confidence that we have everything covered. Everything's been looked at. Assumptions are defined in your report, and it's easy to spot by a reviewer to make sure, oh yeah, this kind of makes sense. If they see something weird with the bending moment, you can spot it sometimes right here or often right here. So this is the benefit of this kind of model. So how do you do this? If you're one of my students, you're wondering, okay, let's cut to the chase. How do I need to do my project? Uh, and if you're in industry, hopefully you're inspired by the beauty of this simple model. Now, we already said you typically want a bunch of uh, dummy structure about a diameter away. But that's not always true uh, or always needed. If you have a simple loading, in this particular case, this model here, we had nearly a diameter of dummy structure on either side of where we're looking at the stresses. But sometimes the loading is benign enough or localized enough where we could say, ah, I think we can get a good enough representation of the frame just looking at one bay of dummy structure on either side. That would be like a bare minimum. And, uh, and for training purposes, it's a great tool. Usually if I'm doing any kind of industry analysis, I'm going to go that diameter away. And a lot of times if your structure is fairly clean, you can just use that same frame model repeat it and make skin model that represents and if your structure is fairly clean that's a sufficient dummy structure then put your your constraints out there but let's take a look at this little project and if you're out there uh, oh and here's a typical analysis this is out of excel a typical analysis analyzing one of the cross sections for this and they had a bunch of analyses for the frames and a bunch of analyses for the floor beams and actually a bunch of analyses for the struts. Okay. So if you're in industry and you're just wanted to be inspired, that's probably all you need to watch. If you want to learn more and practice with this, then stay tuned because you can try doing roughly what my students are doing. If you're one of my students and you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I do this kind of model, then uh, this is a quick look at part of that project that I posted. It gives a lot of direction on how exactly to create your model. And you should be able to, from what we've learned in our Nastran class and with your Nastran primer, you should be able to walk through this and model up this single frame. Then we're going to make dummy structure and we're going to cut it as tight as possible by just making one bay of dummy structure on either side. Let's take a look at how that works. And if you want to try this with industry, you can just take a pause here uh, or take a photograph of this slide or a screen copy, and then you can try and make this model and then uh, try it on your own. So this is a little graphic looking at 
uh, here is uh, that little model. And if you walk through this, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be defining your grid points. It tells you where to put grid point one, where to put how to define all your other grid points and stringer spacings. And this is not actually so my students are going to go ahead in their in their homework. They're first going to draw this up a single frame and how it looks with all the appropriate numbering. And the numbering I'm not sh I'm showing here is not enough. It's just to wet your juices on what you're going to do because this is your project. What you're going to do is follow the instructions. You're going to need to show this node. You're going to want to show how the typical numbering is. You're going to want to show this first node, maybe a node at the center line, if there's one there, and a node at the floor attachment, how the numbering continues, what these numbers are, what this number is, maybe a couple more, and then the last number before the, the first again. Then you're going to lay in your C-bar elements from one to two with your orientation vector going down. You can put a, you can actually either use one center like most node of the floor or define another point at the center, fix that, don't tie it to anything, but you can just use that as your orientation vector if you like. Some folks instead will use the next bay, the next stringer node, and define their plane one in the plane of the skin because then you don't need an additional node. I actually don't like that approach because we tend to think of the larger bending moment being in that plane one. And so I like to aim it toward the center and using a floor node would be fine. So you want to show how those bar numbers are near the top as you approach and leave the floor attachment, as you approach and leave each strut attachment, floor attachment, and back to the top. So you want to show those numbering and have a little, you can see here, like with the, my model that I showed you before, the CASD model that I showed you of the nose, I had all the elements shrunk whenever I show it. And this is a, a good uh, tool when you're using FEMAP or PATRAN is to shrink your elements some percentage so you can see where they end. Uh, so you've got blank space between the rods and or bars and the nodes and between the quads and the nodes. You can kind of see how it all ties together. So you want to kind of sketch your model in that same way with shrunk down, like an exploded free body diagram almost, uh, shrunk down elements as you go around. Then you want to show, now uh, I gave specific direction on how to distribute, how many nodes to use for the floor and that kind of thing, where these struts go, uh, and information and how many B C bars are used in the floor and in the struts. Now in industry, you use however many you need using more typically is better along there when you want the uh, nice definition to your floor. For my students, you're going to follow exactly how many elements I say. You need to show what this node is, what some of these node numberings are as you are near the ends, near the struts and near the ends the numbering for the struts, how those tie together, and uh, this will enable you to understand uh, how your model is laid out. You're going to find that you run into places where you're like, hmm, does it work this way or this way? And without this kind of detail, you're not going to know. So by laying this out first by hand, it makes a lot quicker to model than FEMAP or PATRAN. So you're also going to want dimensions, like what's the radius or the diameter. You're going to want to show what the uh, X or Y positions are of like the struts and things like this. Maybe the position, the vertical height of the floor and how that relates to the center line. You're going to want those kind of dimensions shown on here. This graphic, and I'm focused just on the frame graphic right now, should show not necessarily all of the nodes, although you could show them all, but all the nodes you need to completely define all of the interactions and all of the C bars that you need or C beams, in our case, we're making C bars, all the C bars you need to represent all of the interfaces and how that transitions at the starts, at the ends and at the interfaces. Same thing with the floor beam, same thing with the strut. Once you're done with that, you're then going to lay on the applied loading. And that happens to be a distributed loading for this particular case. You're going to want to identify what that is, not just what a, a variable, but what, what the actually magnitude is. So you're going to have a few dimensions on this, a few loads on this, and a lot of information about how this single frame is modeled. Okay. Once you finish that, you then are going to need your dummy structure. And what we're going to do 
is put a wagon wheel one frame bay away, which I think I called out to be 20 inches, which is a typical transport aircraft frame bay. We're going to put one, now sometimes, a lot of times you're going to be cantilevered off, but because there's structure fore and after this usually, we're going to put one frame bay away this way and one frame bay away this way. Not a diameter away, but just one frame bay away. And then what we're going to do, so what we're going to do there is those stringers, now you're going to have stringers, you need rod elements of those stringers or whatever I said in your, in your write-up. And you're going to need quad elements or shear elements. I think I said C shear elements in my model, but we actually are going to cover that this following week. So if you don't, you could actually read ahead and use the C shears, but I, uh, you can just use C quad elements for your skin if you're nervous about using the C shears, which are a little bit tricky to use. They have some benefits, but they're a little tricky in the way Nastran defines them. So, uh, what I'm saying now is if you're doing the project for my class, if we have not covered C shears by the time you do this project, you're welcome to use C quads instead of C shears, and you'll get similar results or the same results, okay? So we're going to actually define up one bay of quad elements and rod elements so that your structure goes back, and then we're going to define a wagon wheel that at the center. You're not going to make a whole frame there. You're just going to have those points and then a wagon wheel, and you're going to fix that middle. And then we're going to come forward one frame bay, and so we have the skin coming forward, and we have another wagon wheel we're going to find. Let's take a look at this, and you will see, and that's what this little graphic down here is showing. I actually show, I'm showing an exploded diagram where you got the frame that we're looking at here now show as a semi-isometric, and then a little tube of skin, which is skin and stringers, another tube forward of that frame, and then your wagon wheel, which basically takes all those points along the periphery and fixes it at the middle with the kind of bending element that I talked about that will breathe on both ends. And then a little graphic here on the forwardmost one, I'm showing you kind of how like the I1 and the I2 for Nastran of that beam and the small axial stiffness is for one of the many uh, little elements that are going around. You can see I drew a bunch of those elements at the back one, and I didn't draw hardly any except the one I'm trying to show those dimensions. So that's kind of how you're going to do this. Let's take a look at how this works. It's going to be kind of fast, but let's go ahead and run it. You're going to see me sketching this quickly right here. So this is how you're going to kind of lay out some geometry, lay out your loads and forces and all this. And you can slow down your video if you want to see this show or slower. Let's take a look at it again. That's how that's going to do. And you're going to show, you're going to do this neater. You're going to fill your page and you're going to show more detail so that everything you need at the interfaces is clear. Let's look at it one more time. So kind of rough that out. You can do it a little neater than what I'm doing here and show more detail. You're going to show first the frame in one view and then this isometric. Although for my students, you're going to show this frame is basically going to fill your page and then that isometric is going to fill another page. And that will be your first turn in for this project. Second part of the project is going to go do the rest to go ahead and make the model. In either, you can actually do this with Nastran, just typing in each command. Or you can use FEMAP or Patran to model that up. Make sure that you create the FEM documentation report. As indicated, any of you that are out there in industry or students from other places that are studying finite elements, if you want to try the same thing and learn how to do a, a good documentation of a fine element model, I have two tools for you. If you go to my website, toddcoburn.com, and go to the Navigate to the Publications page, there's a spot where I tell you I've got some of my uh, publications are there, but also there's a couple tools where students, there's a, there's a FEM documentation template, and a FEMAP documentation template. And the FEMAP documentation template, you could call it a Patran documentation template if you like, but those are two templates for a report that you would, uh, if you're writing up a report for a model that you created, the kind of information that you should report. And that's what you're gonna do for the second part of this project, the main part of this project, okay? So that's how you can do it. And if you wanna practice with that in industry, feel free to do that, download those free tools, and you can try it out as well. I think that's all I got for you. 
Uh, hopefully that sheds some light on how this works. And I hope you find this valuable in your engineering work. Go out there and be great. Oh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. If you're out there in industry and you find a lot of useful content, I'd like to invite you to become a member of my channel, which costs uh, like a dollar a month or something for the lowest level of membership. That'll give you some uh, extra little perks, but mainly it's a way of saying, Thank, thank you for the free content, and uh, feel free to comment on the videos. I will uh, respond as best I can. Uh, sometimes I'll take longer to respond if I need to kind of investigate if uh, there's a question about something, but usually I respond pretty quickly for most of the comments out there. So uh, if you are learning to, wanting to learn Nastran, you can, uh, my Nastran primer is really inexpensive. It's a great tool for novices for fine elements or somebody who's been doing fine element modeling but not working with Nastran, this is a great way to master the Nastran part. So go out there, be great. Thanks for listening. Uh, have a great day.